So uh, we are going to try and, uh, you know how academics think, you know, you sort of have a, a statement in it and the first thing an academic says is, well, it's a little more complicated than that. <laughs> That's this session. Um, we are going to talk about, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have Lise Elliott introduce herself. We're going to talk about some of her work as a neuroscientist and her book, which is a fabulous uh, book uh, called Pink Brain, Blue Brain. Um, and, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what the science tells us and what it doesn't tell us. Um, and um, so I think, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, so we're going to talk about biological differences between women and men. And we're going to talk about the politics of, the, of those questions and how we think about them. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, my name's Lise Elliott, and I'm a professor of neuroscience at Chicago Medical School of Rosalind Franklin University. And if you don't know Rosalind Franklin, she's an extremely important figure in, uh, the, in the history of science and women in science. So we're very proud of that. Um, so I uh, started my career poking electrodes into brain cells and uh, trying to understand how we learn. So I didn't start working on sex or gender at all. I was more uh, curious about something we call neuroplasticity, how the brain changes as a result of experience. And when I first started in this field, nobody knew this word plasticity. Now you can barely open the health pages of a newspaper without how to keep your brain young through neuroplasticity. Well. Um, I uh, started having babies and started writing books, not nearly as many as Michael, but I've written a couple of books. And the first book uh, is called What's Going On in There, about how the brain and mind develop in the first five years. Um, and I was able to take my knowledge of uh, both the nature and the nurture side of the equation to talk about early development and uh, you know how what's important in, in brain wiring and how that affects children's later cognitive emotional abilities. Well, along the way, uh, you come across a lot of studies of gender difference, um, and I started having girls and boys. <laughs> I had a daughter and then two sons, and like most parents, you uh, become very curious. And I, unfortunately, most parents we see these we see differences because uh, we live in a very gender binary world. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about that. And um, and we uh, the the kind of default assumption is that these differences are hardwired. That we see differences in boys and girls and must be all evolution and, and brain wiring. Well, uh, so I started writing the book, and I was really uh, rather shocked to see that what we neuroscientists know about brain sex differences is, is this big. And it's not for lack of trying. I mean, it turns out the, the, the brain is a unisex organ. Uh, male brains and female brains are not much different from each other than male hearts and female hearts, and male kidneys and female kidneys. But when you're talking about uh, gender differences, we really have to take a developmental perspective. And the plasticity part of the equation has really been left out uh, largely in terms of how brain sex evolves. So I'll. Well, th great. So this is a terrific introduction. Um, and let me, so let me, let, let me give you a little anecdote because I believe that right now, well, mic check. Okay, so I, I actually think that our default position as a culture has often been a kind of essentialist idea that women and men are from different planets, Mars and Venus, that we are completely hardwired to be completely different. And, um, and so one thing, as, and I'm a social scientist, right? So as a social scientist, I, I always question the parents who say, well, I have one boy and one girl. They're completely different, see? Because that's, that's too small a sample. Um, but, but my students, so when, but when I, I start my classes every year when I teach a course on sociology of gender with the, following, with, the, with the following little experiment, because I think we believe that we believe in gender different, in essential gender difference, but I actually believe that we don't really believe it. So here's what I do. I ask my students, um, you know those kind of human continuum uh, questions like, okay, array yourself on a continuum from really strongly disagree to really strongly agree. And then we'll sort of see where the class uh, sort of falls out. So the first question I ask is, apart from anatomy, there really aren't any differences between women and men. There's really nothing inherently feminine nor inherently masculine. And as you could probably predict, my students are way on the strongly disagree side, completely disagree with that. I say, fine, 
So what are those differences? Within 10 seconds, the class has completely achieved consensus that it is testosterone, that men and women are different because men are more violent and more aggressive. And the cause of that violence and aggression is testosterone. I say, OK, fine. So that's where you are. So answer this question for me. Again, same continuum. Peace is a gender issue. If women were running things, there would be less risk of violence and war. Now, logically, you might be saying to yourselves right now, well, then they would certainly agree with that, given what they just said. My students completely disagree with that, too. Isn't that interesting? So I say, well, why? Well, I mean, it's logical that you'd say, look, if you woke up tomorrow morning, seriously, think about this for a moment. If you woke up tomorrow morning and there was a woman in charge of every single local, national, state, transnational political institution, would you sleep better at night? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you would be on the agree side. <laughs> So, I, but I ask them and they say, no, no, whoever occupies that position has to be willing to be aggressive, to put their finger on that button. What about Golda Meir? What about Indira Gandhi? What about Margaret Thatcher? What about Hillary Clinton? So, I say to them, so what you're saying to me now, despite the essential differences, is that the person who occupies the position it's the, the position is more important than the gender of the person who occupies it. And they say, absolutely. And I say, welcome to social science. So that's what I mean, but when I believe that our essentialism, our belief in these, in these biological differences, is actually what I call soft essentialism. We don't really believe it. We believe it when it's convenient to not engage with the topic. And then we don't believe it when it's convenient to not engage with the topic. I think we're scared of this. I don't think we really know what we're going to find. So, so I'm hoping that you, Lisa, are going to be able to tell us actually from the position. And one, one of the things, being a social scientist, I don't read neuroscience very often. This is a really readable book. Um, so it was very helpful to me. So he, he, help us through this. What are the differences? What are the differences? Yeah. Are there any? And right. what are they? So, um, you know, we've, neuroscience is a relatively new science, but, but not I've been at this for 25 years, so it's not as new as it was when I started. And um, uh, especially since we've had brain imaging, everybody knows about uh, MRI and then functional MRI, which is where you're able to put somebody in a, in a brain scanner and give them a task, say reading words or recognizing emotional expression, and then look at where the changes in the blood flow happen. We don't actually measure electrical activity directly with fMRI. We measure changes in blood flow that are a reflection of which part of the brains are active. And so you've all seen these pictures in the newspaper of areas lighting up when we do things. So this kind of research has been going on since the late 80s, early 90s. So we now have uh, going on three decades of, of brain findings. And, um, in spite of this uh, belief in a male brain and a female brain, even though the pop psychology sections of the bookstore, you know, you've got male brain and female brain, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, which is ultimately tried to be linked to um, uh, brain differences. Um, it turns out, as I said, that, that uh, the brain is a unisex organ. We all have the same structures, amygdala, hippocampus, every gyrus is the same. Um, although biologists love this term, sexual dimorphism. Uh, you know, that's how we describe how evolution made the peacock's tail big and males and small through sexual selection. Dimorphism, two shapes. So unfortunately, biologists, being biologists and not social sci scientists, anytime they see a sex difference, no matter how small, and these differences really are quite quite small. We're talking about 1% of the variance in, we're not talking about presence or absence of structure, but 1% of the variance in the volume of the hippocampus is attributable to sex or gender. And um, so these are very, they're minute, according to one uh, Swedish researcher who studied 1,000 brains. Sex differences in the brain are minute. And that is in adult brains, too, mm -hmm. by the way. So obviously men and women behave differently, um, but neuroscientists have yet to find a single circuit that 
works differently, that is wired differently. We are wired the same. There may be slight statistical differences. And in fact, the actual psychology of sex differences finds, and this is the work of Janet Hyde at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, she wrote this radical paper called the Gender Similarities Hypothesis because most of our measures of, of difference, I mean, aggression is actually one of the larger sex differences. The average male is more aggressive than two-thirds of females. But that also means one-third of females are more aggressive than the average male. These are not binary. These are not dimorphisms. These are not different shapes. Um, and so there are, there are slight statistical differences between men and women's brain um, activity in certain measures. And the issue is, is it nature or nurture? And we all kind of assume, because the brain is biology, that this is hardwired, that this is nature. If we see a sex difference in the brain, and so the neuroscience of sex differences really reinforce this essentialism that I think we're going to talk about, when the fact is, plasticity, <laughs> our brains wire up as a result of experience. And this experience begins at the moment of birth in terms of gender interactions, because boys and girls, we know we interact with differently because we have different expectations. So, so really, there is, there is no male brain, female brain. Absolutely not. And in fact, I mean, the, the fact that transgenderism is as common as it is proves how easy it is, in, in a sense, that we're, we're, we have a, a so, spectrum. OK, so that's going to beg, beg a question. But before, before I get to sort of the politics question that it begs, so what about the gay brain? Now, we do know from Simon LeVay's, Simon LeVay made the argument that one little tiny part of the anterior hypothalamus had something to do with sexual orientation, or that at least with, with sexual uh, function. So could you say a little bit about that? You've heard, you, you know this stuff, because uh, this is, yeah. some of these are really masterpieces of, of sort of problematic research. Yeah. Uh, so um, and this is one of them. Right. Uh, and. Um, you know, unlike most areas of biology, I think neuroscience is more vulnerable to, to larger social forces. Um, and uh, so Simon LeVay is a, a gay, outward, um, out gay neuroscientist, and he uh, published a paper in 91, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Very small study published in Science, which is very high profile, and they found this tiny little nucleus in the anterior. The anterior, hy the hypothalamus itself is the size of a dime. The anterior hypothalamus is, is a, a tenth of Rain a dime. Of the and this nucleus, which they call the sexually dimorphic nucleus, is literally one tenth of a millimeter in diameter. So, you know, picture a pencil point and a tenth of that. Um, and they found that it's larger in men than women. And that much is true. This has been replicated. In science nowadays, we must find replication because we're so, we've discovered how biased we are in spite of our objective methods. And uh, it's very easy to find what you're looking for. So I don't believe anything unless it's been published by two, three, four independent laboratories. So we do know this little tiny SDN, sexually dimorphic nucleus, is larger in males than females. That's been replicated. LeVay had a study with gay uh, men and straight men and straight women and found that the, the homosexual men had a SDN about the same size as, as, the, women. as the women. However, that was not replicated by independent groups. And so even though it was the gay brain and it's got a lot of press, and I think he kind of wrote a whole book on it, um, we don't believe that anymore. But to me, as a social, <laughs> well, but as a social scientist, what was interesting is his study comes out in science, and suddenly he's on the cover of Time, Newsweek, every single major okay. magazine, 60 Minutes, everybody covered it. And to me, again, so I, read, I went and read the study. And what was interesting, of course, now remember, the size of this anterior hypothalamus in, in this particular nucleus in, in gay men was the same size as women. All of the gay men, this is 1991, the study was done in the late 80s, all of the gay men had died of HIV. In the late 80s, when brains were, were preserved, they, because of HIV and fear of, of contagion, the, the, the formaldehyde solution that they were preserved in was double the strength of, the, of other brains. Now, what does formaldehyde do to brains? It removes the liquid. That's how it preserves them. Shrinks them. Right, it yeah. shrinks them. <laughs> so what, you, what I think the, the National Institute for Health funded was a study of the effect of the strength of formaldehyde on the, <laughs> on the nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus, which we know now shrinks it. <laughs> um, but I don't think it's it. So, so this is yeah. one of those cases. And 
Um, and, it, and it brings up for me that we keep finding these things. We keep looking for difference. We keep finding it. It keeps getting discredited in a way, and yet we seem so eager to, uh, to find it. I, I'll give you one sort of historical example. The best-selling book on education in, uh, in the 19th century was Edward C. Clarke's book, Sex and Education. It came out in 1874. Mm -hmm. Edward C. Clarke was the first, um, the first pro full professor of education anywhere in, in, in the nation at Harvard. And his book, Sex and Education, made the following argument. He argued that women going into higher education was a really bad idea because if women went to college, their brains would get bigger and heavier and their wombs would shrink. <laughs> now, his evidence, his evidence for this was that college-educated women had fewer children than non-college-educated women. <laughs> he also found that in mental hospitals in the state of Massachusetts, there were a higher percentage of college-educated women than non-college-educated women, but non-college-educated men over college-educated men. So you see, not only does it make your womb shrink, but it also drives you mad. <laughs> so this, now this, this book went through 15 printings in the, first, in the 19th century alone. This was the single best-selling book. Now you have a guy at Google who writes a, a manifesto, he has a Jerry Maguire moment, writes a manifesto about the differences between women and men at Google, gets fired, and is now the poster boy of besieged men who feel that the workplace has been turned toward, toward women. And, so, and, and crazy feminist scientists who deny science. Right, yeah, who deny so science. I've been equated with a climate denier because, <laughs> because I challenge these claims about massive sex differences, you know, and... So, 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 so tell us a little bit about the James Damore uh, argument and tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about why it is that we seem so desperate to find differences. Yeah, so what, these, the, I mean, you talked about the uh, Clark and then these uh, eruptions seem to happen periodically uh, during, on the dawn of women's suffrage in 1918, 1915. In the US, we got suffrage in 1920 there were suddenly uh, similar manifestos that appeared in the New York Times uh, by, uh, of all people, Charles Dana, who's a big figure in the history of neurology. There's a Dana Foundation that funds a lot of research in neuroscience. And so I was pretty shocked to discover that he wrote this letter to the New York Times um, backing the group that was anti-suffrage uh, based on differences in men and women's brains. And although men's brains are 10% larger than women's, and that's usually the thing that keeps bringing this topic back over and over you know, since the 18th century. What, what um, Dana focused on for some reason was the spinal cord that women's narrow spinal cords somehow impeded <laughs> rational judgment and decision making. Um, but uh, anyway, Is, somehow we... Why? <laughs> right, because it's there. Because, I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, um, just like the womb, anything uh, you yeah. can... And, you know, Damore actually, the so this has been the latest surge. We had the Larry Summers debacle in 2005, and then... Um, Damore actually didn't talk about the brain in his manifesto, but he did talk um, about testosterone. He said, you know, these differences, and he talked about psychological differences, and he particularly focused on um, neuroticism, so females are more neurotic, females are more agreeable, females are less status-oriented, and this was the rationale for why <coughs> women uh, have not and will not achieve leadership. Uh, at Google or any industry, uh, he didn't get into the math science stuff, which is always, which is what Larry Summers uh, waded into. Um, but there certainly are people that that believe that male brains are better cut out for math and science, and they always try to link it to testosterone. So I'll tell you, testosterone does have effects on behavior. It it does contribute to aggression in most animals and. Uh, probably in humans as well, but uh, it's just a tilt. It's just a tipping point. And furthermore, the, pu the, the testosterone at puberty, which is where you really see the big differences in mm -hmm. male-female aggression, are completely uncorrelated with testosterone levels. This is work of John Archer at, right. in Lancaster. They have looked at this at every possible dimension and have struggled to find a correlation uh, within males between testosterone level and aggression. Right. 
Um, and furthermore, the aggression thing is really complex. I'm sure you're familiar with um, uh, domestic uh, partner aggression. Mm -hmm. And within couples, females are actually are likelier to assault than males, or at least um, uh, this was also from uh, Archer's data, that, yeah. that within couples there's actually quite a bit, probably because males are, are, have learned that uh, there's a much greater cost if they uh, physically aggress against a female. Well, let me, uh, I'm going to well, comment on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to comment on that because they, that data, Murray Strauss's research, for example, at the at University of New Hampshire has found that it, this is a, in research that, that looks at what called conflict tactics is the, 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 and if you ask a married couple, have you ever used violence in the course of your relationship, an equal number of women and men will say yes. However, however, that doesn't factor in severity, yeah. frequency, who initiated it, whether the violence was aggressive or defensive, that is to say a woman using violence to protect her children from the violence of, of the father. Um, and so, and, and if you factor those in, then it begins to skew a lot toward what we already know about violence against women. More than that, it only looks at intact married couples. So if you look at divorced couples, for example, you, it, nearly 100% of the violence is men to women. If you look at post-relationship, stalking, et cetera. If you look at sexual assault, which it also doesn't ask, rape, it also skews so heavily toward males. So if you actually factor all those things in, it looks like the, mm -hmm. the, what, what we think. Yeah. But the point is, everybody's competitive and everybody's aggressive. Right. And, and you, don't need, you, don't, you don't need to say it's equivalent in order to say that. Right, we, find we have different strategies for doing it. I think uh, physical aggression works better for males because they're physically larger. And uh, re relational aggression works better for females as anyone who ever lived through middle school uh, is probably quite right. familiar with. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and the fact that everyone laughed at that is, is we all know that. Yeah. We all know Although that. Although men engage in relational aggression you bet. as well. You bet. Yeah. So, so, so there's a couple of things that I want to I want to say about this. I want to make this you know a little more complicated. Um, <laughs> I want to add um, something else that we often don't talk about when we talk about the the the, sec the biology of the sexes, and that is that a lot of the conversation within the biological or the pseudo scientific world is also raced, and we don't often see that. Not of course in the conversations about brains, <laughs> but I want to I want to just read you a passage from a credible, a, a, a pair of biologists who wrote an article in a biology journal about why it is that girls, you know, pink brain, blue brain, why pink and red for girls and blue for boys, why this is natural, why this is biological. Here's what they say. They say that, uh, they have two reasons. One, as gatherers, women developed a preference for red hues uh, like pink, because they needed to identify ripe fruits and berries. Further, women, and this is a quote, women needed to discriminate subtle changes in skin color due to emotional states and social sexual signals in their roles as caregivers and empathizers. Now, I'm hoping that you all saw that as the whitest statement you could make. <laughs> Who did they think these, these early hominids were <laughs> on the African savanna, noticing if their child was blushing? <laughs> did they think the first humans were white? I mean, it's, so you see how this is yeah. so subtly raced. Not only that, of course, most of you know that it, up until the early 20th century, boys and girls were dressed similarly as toddlers in like what looked like white christening gowns. If you don't believe me, Google FDR baby. <laughs> and you'll see him in his little white christening gown. He looks like an adorable little girl. Until the age of three or four or exactly. five. Exactly. Yeah. And right. then initially, they were co it was coded uh, pink, pink and red for boys and blue for girls because blue was the color of the sky. It was airy and light. And Virgin Mary right. is usually painted in blue. In blue. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so just, I mean, so it's bad history, but also bad racial politics. So this, this has a racial component as well as a gender component. Yeah. And the pink-blue thing, now uh, a couple of different um, infant psychologists have studied baby color preference, because you can do these great experiments on infants by look, tracking their retinas and what they're focusing on. And it turns out there is no gender difference. Boys and girls uh, don't prefer pink or blue until about two or three years of age. And of course, by then, they've been swaddled and bundled and had their hair bands, and they know quite well uh, what is appropriate for them and, and not. So. 
so, so, so let's, 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 let's get to the, the politics question. Why are we so desperate, do you think? As a scientist, how do you read our temper that we are so desperate to believe in categorical difference when that, that confirms all the stereotypes that we already hold? How are we, uh, what are we to make of this? Why do we keep looking when you all keep saying, there's no there there? What is it about our, our temperament that, that wants us to believe this? Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to say it's you all, but I, I think biologists have been very guilty of this, um, of fueling the fire, because sex differences sell. Look at every magazine. I mean, sex sells. And so neuroscientists, when they run a brain scan, um, you know, hopefully they have a decent sized sample, a couple hundred people. Uh, you're studying what you're studying. You're studying face recognition, you're studying language, whatever. You publish your paper, yay. You really want to get tenure, you want to publish another paper. So what do you do? You go back to the data, you analyze it for sex. You look at the male group, the female group. If you find a significant difference, guess what? You have another paper. And a grant. Yeah. And if you don't find a difference, uh, nobody's interested in lack of difference. And so we have a very real uh, file drawer phenomenon. And, and uh, right. a group at Stanford just proved this for functional brain imaging, that all the small studies, you only see sex differences in the small studies. The large studies, there's very few sex differences. And that's exactly the opposite of what the statistics would predict. Statistics would predict with larger studies, big data, if any of you went to the prior section, you have more sensitivity to, to find difference. Mm -hmm. And so there's a huge bias in the literature. So there's this just zeitgeist out there of men and women are fundamentally different, our <coughs> brains are different. And it must, you know, it. For one thing, it's fun and sexy, and uh, especially you know, college students love this kind of thing because they're right at that age when they're, they're most invested in their gender identity or their sexual identity. But uh, in addition, it reinforces our existing status quo. I mean, our, we have a power structure that is very much, what looks like a sex difference is very often uh, status differences, which was, which was a big revelation for me. The, the, the thing that's interesting to me teaching at a, univer a, a university that is co-educational is my students are sitting in the same class, reading the same text, grading, you know, uh, writing the same papers, being graded by the same criteria, and nobody ever goes to the dean of students and says, well, like, I'm a Martian, and my professor's a Venusian, so, like, shouldn't I get extra credit or a translator? My students are perfectly capable of being in the same place, reading the same book, taking the same test, being graded by the same criteria, and nobody makes a big Mars-Venus difference, because in practice, they're far more similar, right? Uh, but, it, so this, this raises a question, again, the social science question. So which gender is more committed to biological essential difference. <laughs> yeah. Which gender benefits from this? Which gender wants it? Here's Simon Baron Cohen, Sasha's dad. Um, cousin. Cousin, I'm oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, <laughs> who writes in his book, Essential Difference, the female brain is predominantly hardwired for empathy, and the male brain is predominantly hardwired for understanding and building systems. Now, how many of the women in here are insulted by that? All right. Now, how many of the men are insulted by that? Like, not empathic, <laughs> right? not yeah. capable. So interesting. Yeah. I think men are far more committed to essential difference than women are, in the same way that surveys have suggested that gay men are far more likely to believe that, they are hard that sexuality is hardwired than lesbians are. Hmm. Uh, something sure. something yeah. in the neighborhood right. of of 75 to 80% of gay men and somewhere, somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 45% of mm -hmm. women. Yeah. Well, um, it, uh, you know, wh whoever has the power is going to be invested in proving that this is the way it's supposed to be. Right. And so, I mean, y you could say the same thing about analyses of racial differences uh, in, the, in, the, in the 19th century. You know, we were finding all these, they were measuring brains of people from different countries and finding these big differences and explaining who was doing that work. Well, I can tell you, it wasn't African scientists doing that work. Right. So we have very much the same, like I said, these eruptions keep happening. Every time you know, women uh, are nearly achieving some level of breakthrough, then we, we kind of default back to this backlash of, well, that's fine, but we're only going to, you know, women can only expect to achieve so much because of these hardwired differences. And so we've had a debate, for example, about math achievement. 
uh, uh, actually average math scores no longer differ between <coughs> males and females uh, in large representative samples across the country. Girls have caught up to boys in math. But if you look at the most extreme tail, the right tail, the high performing, mm. um, there was data in the, in, the, in the 80s that looked at eighth graders and who scored perfect on the math SAT exam. Well, that's eighth grade's pretty young for, for math SAT exam. And among the, the students who performed perfectly, the ratio was 13 to 1, boys to girls yeah. outperforming. And so that, again, science papers, policy, you know, maybe we're, we, you know, what are we trying to do, push these girls into STEM when, you know, the talent pool, and this was what Larry Summers relied on yeah. in 2005 in arguing why Harvard had no tenured women uh, science and math professors, or extremely few. Well, you know, maybe average performance is the same, but high tail performance, yes. brilliance in math is a uniquely or almost uniquely male phenomenon. Well, guess what? That 13 to 1 ratio is now a four to one ratio or even a three to one ratio. Uh, over the course of one generation, 25 years, that ratio has declined. Guess why? Well, we've encouraged girls to do math. We've started to tell them, you can do math. You're smart at math. They're taking calculus now in equal numbers as boys. And so uh, this, this ratio has declined a lot. But um, you know, we're just very invested in finding something to represent what already exists. And, uh, it's a matter of giving up power. Yeah. Um, I do want to say something since you've invoked Larry, Larry Summers' uh, infamous uh, 2005. Everybody knows what, what we're talking about. Um, he was asked at a conference, is off the, off the cuff, asked at a conference uh, why there were so few women at the very, very top of the premier uh, STEM fields, uh, not only Harvard, MIT, et cetera. And his answer was, and this is the, this is the quote that at least that the Harvard Crimson reported, was that most women are unable or unwilling to work the 80 hours a week it takes to rise to that level. So, I, you know, now I think everyone focused on the unable part, the, the biological mm -hmm. in, inability. Mm -hmm. But as a social scientist, I thought to myself, well, you know, what about the unwilling part? So let's take that as a you know, model. Instead of like saying, okay, where are the binders filled of women who are willing to do this, you know, um, rather ask the question, okay, let's take, Take, the, take that model, the 80 hour week, a work week. So you work 80 hours, the 168 hours in a week. You work 80 of them. You drive the American average of 35 minutes each way to work. Uh, let's say you have a designated parking space. I'm from New York, that's a big deal. Um, so uh, uh, let's say you sleep the American average of seven and a half hours a night. Let's say it takes you two hours every day to, uh, prepare, uh, to prepare and consume all meals, perform all sanitary events. <laughs> Um, and, um, and I give you one date a week. By a date, I mean sort of, you know, dinner, movie, make love. Now, I gave that five hours. You could see a shorter movie. But <laughs> if, you, if you add that up, what you get is 37 and a half minutes a day to read, watch TV, engage in any hobbies that you might have, and spend time with your children. So the wrong answer to that question is how many women are willing to do that to rise to that level? And the right answer to that question is who in their right mind would do this? And which gender thought this up as a good model for a career ladder, mm -hmm. right? So it seems to me that that's the sociology. So, the, so, so again, so this is a place where, and one of the reasons that I was so excited to do this with Lise is because I think these are places where so, the, the social science and the neuroscience meet the questions of why we, want, why we are so desperate for these differences. So let me ask you a last question, and then I want to open it up for, for your questions and comments as well. So let me ask you this. Are there any differences that you know that seem to matter in, in this? Are, you know, the there can be differences without difference. Right. Right, so I mean, I have uh, done a very thorough review with my students. I'm a, we're about to publish a big, big review on this. In terms of brain volumes, as I said, male brains are bigger than female brains, but as every other organ is also larger in males, the kidney, the liver, the heart. You don't hear about that very much, uh, but uh, and so when we're looking for individual differences in the brain, and we do this whether we're interested in gender or not, neuroscientists 
you correct for brain size. Even if you're comparing a large male to a small male, you must normalize their overall brain size when you want to know, is the hippocampus, which is important for memory, bigger? Is the amygdala, which is important for emotion and aggression, bigger? You need to always uh, co-vary, as we say, or normalize for brain size. And so when we've done, when neuroscientists do this, correct for individual brain size, there are no differences in the size of the structures in our brain. What about the circuits? Okay, what about the connections? Yeah. The current data are all over the map because this connectome research is relatively new, but the differences are minute. They're, uh, like I said, on the order of 1% of the range of connectivity across the human species can be explained by gender. Education, socioeconomic status, all these things have much bigger effects. And most importantly, this idea that we have uh, different circuits. There is not a single ability, language, math, face recognition, in which males and females use different brain structures or different circuits to carry out these tasks. And this has been looked at, again, by uh, dozens of labs all over the world. But so there, the circuits th are the same. So there, there isn't the sort of the brain lateralization uh, oh. stuff, the, the, those, the two sides, the left brain, right brain, the connections between them, how severely lateralized, none of that really... We are all, we're all left lateralized. So there was a big splash, a big study came out from Penn in 2013, uh, studying adolescents and claimed, and it was reported in 300 news outlets, and they showed this subway map of brain connections. Right. And um, unfortunately, they didn't show the actual connections, they showed the connections that were statistically significantly different. And so you show this show, subway map of men's brains are all like this, with intra-hemisphere connections just within one side. Women's brains were all like this, with these connections across the hemispheres. Well, of course, these weren't men and women. These were actually adolescents. <laughs> and they did not correct for brain size. So again, it turns out larger brains have relatively uh, smaller intra-hemispheric connections because um, it's just too inefficient. It's, it's an engineering problem. When the brain gets big, you can't get information across enough. And so statistically, you... It's about the size. Okay. Yeah, so... so it, it, because for me, it, the, the idea that the subway map um, get, illustrate your earlier point, because in New York City, the subway map, is, it's always under construction <laughs> Late, lately. Right. So, yeah. so that's the idea, that it's always responding to environmental, mm -hmm. environmental stimuli. Well, There's that's nothing the, that's so, sort of like fixed. Absolutely, and that's the most important point uh, that I want to make about the brain is we've been studying neuroplasticity for 50 years. We know the brain changes as a result of learning. That's why you all are here, to hope to learn something, to change your synapses. Uh, that's mm -hmm. that's uh, how children learn anything. And to, to take a snapshot of men and women's brains at 25, 35 years of age and claim that any small difference you detect is hardwired is ignoring the 25 or 30 years of experience and socializing with friends and math problems and sports that they've played, which are going to be uh, affecting those circuits as well. Maybe we should co-author a book like Not Mars and Venus, but we're all Earthlings. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let, let's, let's open it up for, for your questions and comments. We have a microphones um, spattered around, and we have some people already. You, you right there, and then you right here, second, and over there, third and fourth. Hi, Joni Liebeck. Um, have there been uh, studies about how the biology can make for the differences and the experiences in the sense that um, women get their periods, so they're in pain every month, possibly, mm -hmm. as kids, and so they're much more aware of their role um, birthing the child, and so empathy can be more um, instinctive, and they have to be more protective in that way. Even the sexual act is different. The guy has to, you know, perform, and then he leaves. Um, so how much he doesn't does have that, to leave. <laughs> how much does that influence yeah, neuroplasticity or? Um, um, so on the first point about the the menstrual fluctuations. Again, this is another area of research where there's been a horrible file drawer problem. Anybody who found a, who did, who measured um, verbal fluency across the menstrual cycle and they found that women were more fluent, you know, when estrogen was peaking and lower during menstruation, bingo, publication. Now we've got many, many large studies. There are no changes in cognition across the menstrual cycle. 
menstrual cycle. Um, you know, our, our, uh, you can do math. You don't have to switch your geometry test by two weeks <laughs> if you have to be menstruating. Um, and then on the nurturing question, so, you know, we, we think, oh, females are instinctively nurturing and men aren't. But it turns out the changes in one's brain after one becomes a parent are the same in men and women. In other words, those, the nurturing is induced by the act of caring for an infant. Mm -hmm. And of course, girls get more practice at that. If there's one thing we can do for boys, it's hire them as babysitters. Mm. You know, I mean, actually, when I was a kid, we had more male babysitters in those days. And now, I, I guess because of fears of, of uh, whatever, or the over-exaggeration of boys' immaturity. Uh, boys don't get that opportunity to, to be nurturers early on. It is learned, even in animals. A female animal that was not around other, other um, young fails um, as a mother the first time around, unless she's had some practice at that. So it's, it's, it, men's testosterone level drops uh, when they uh, when they become new fathers. Absolutely. But yeah. the reason that I mean, look, the bo reason boys I ask my students these questions all the time because I'm interested in uh, wage discrimination and gender gender discrimination in the workplace. So I ask my students how many of them um, were babysitters uh, during middle school or high school, and uh, you know about two thirds of the w the women in the class raise their hands and maybe a scattering of men. And I say, how much did you? get paid and they say oh you know fifteen dollars an hour something like that and um, and I say okay that's fine so on, a, on an average night you would make like sixty seventy five dollars fine how many of the how many of you in the class uh, shoveled snow or mowed lawns and a lot of the guys hands go up and very few women's hands go up. how much did you make well and you know good uh, a, a good morning uh, uh, shoveling snow I could make a hundred dollars a driveway I could do three driveways I could make three hundred dollars in the morning and I said, and, and the women who had been, were, had been babysitters are looking around like, what? <laughs> and I said, so clearly, um, so clearly, you know, this is why boys don't babysit. Um, now, so I said, clearly, wage discrimination, sex segregation in the workplace leads to wage discrimination, starts very early. And of course, the men immediately object, oh my God, no, it is so much harder to shovel snow and, 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 and mow a lawn than it is to care for a baby. Clear indication that no, they, they had never, never cared, cared for a baby. <laughs> but, but even more than that, do we pay people professionally who shovel snow and mow lawns more? Yeah. Uh, certainly not. So in fact, it is really that they are becoming accustomed to the fact that we pay men more than women. And that that's really, that, then that starts very early in our... In, and in, parents pay their sons more for chores than their daughters. I think, so I think that that's a great idea is encouraging you know, encouraging that because that idea, I'm so insulted by that, that Baron Cohen idea that women are hardwired for empathy and I, I feel like, well, that kind of leaves me out, you know. I'm perfectly happy to, you know, design sy and understand systems, but really, <laughs> you know, empathy is, uh, you know, is a, is a core human value. It's pretty handy in the workplace, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Thank you. Uh, Chip Edens, and I'm struck um, that you've debunked most popular literature today. And I was just looking at an article in The Atlantic that was talking about the significant differences between male and female brains. And, I, I, and I, so I'm, I'm, it's really interesting to be able to move away from that consideration and really think about socialization. What are the key pieces of socialization that we really need to be thinking about? Hmm. So I'd love for you to speak to that. Maybe that was your parenting uh, class earlier, mm -hmm. uh, but key considerations of socialization, and then uh, this business of maturity, and this idea of the the male brain, clo you know, the developmentally slower. Mm -hmm. I, I would assume that that would, I'd hope, maybe maybe not the knucklehead effect, uh, that the that that's a, a myth as well. But could you say something about the development of the sure. brain yeah. and, and matters of maturity, wh whether or not that's a social construct, etc. That's a great question. Um, males do develop more slowly than females. Puberty happens one and a half years earlier in girls than boys. And so it's kind of a, a trajectory from birth. And we do know that males are less physiologically mature by about a couple of weeks at birth, judging by their likelier, uh, they're likelier to get all kinds of neonatal infections, respiratory infections, GI infections. Uh, premature males are more likelier to die than premature females. So we do know there's some kind of medical vulnerability. Nobody understands why, what that is, if it's hormonal or, or uh, genetic. But I think that parents 
nowadays, because I think in the olden days, boys were given responsibilities and chores and so on. Now we've kind of overemphasized boys' immaturity. And I think parents use it as an excuse all the time. Teachers use it as an excuse. I've heard teachers say, oh, you know, Johnny's not reading quite as well as, as his sister, but you know, boys are slower. Well, you know, when it comes to cognitive differences, the differences are this big. The language difference, there's a one month difference in vocabulary between boys and girls in the second year of life. One month, girls are, you know, a 13 month old girl has the vocabulary of a 14 month old boy. And yet parents, pediatricians will even say, yeah. oh, you know, don't Boys worry, he's a boy. Yeah, which is the worst thing you can do. Language development is so critical early on. More enrichment, more stories, more songs, more. So we've overemphasized male immaturity. Um, God, when I think of my dad enlisting in World War II and when he was 17 years of age, you know, our 17-year-olds now yeah. <laughs> seem so... My dad did the same thing. Yeah. He lied uh, about his age. Incapable. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think that's one lesson to parents of boys is, um, you know, don't overestimate their immaturity. Um, we know parents treat boys and girls differently. And as we discussed this morning, the biggest problem for gender development right now is that we tell... We tell girls and boys, you can be anything when you grow up, but we only mean it for girls. We only mean you can be an astronaut or a physician or a scientist or a teacher or a nurse. Uh, we say all mom. that. Or a mom, right. And we say that to boys, but we don't really mean about the teacher and the nurse part <laughs> and the nurturing part. You know, we're secretly hoping that they'll uh, do something, because, in part because of the pay. I mean, we all want our kids to uh, go into careers that pay more, and, and all male labeled careers pay more than almost every female label career. But anyway, it's, it's that point about what do, we, what do we say versus what do we really mean. And so when we see boys stopping uh, art classes and, and music classes when they're six, seven, eight years of age, what, how much are we restricting boys' developmental potential whereas we've opened it up for girls with athletics and leadership and all that? Yeah. Uh, you had a question over there, yeah. Hi, my name is Huang. I'm from the Basel Scholars Program. And my question for you is, uh, for both of you, is how can we reduce our preoccupation with gender differences and promote that the neurobiology of men and women are very similar? Mm. Mm. Good question. Want me to? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think as always, um, communicating the real science, the real data, the big data is uh, essential because we've been relying too much on tiny little anecdotes. And I do, we are making some progress, I think, among the neuroscientists. And this is where scientists have to uh, step up to their social responsibility and appreciate how I information is being misused. Um, I would just challenge everybody, when you hear about a sex difference, to just examine it a second time and ask, is that really a sex difference? Is that really something about males and females? Or does that relate to status and power? So for example, you know, when James Damore says that women aren't cut out, and it's true that women score higher on measures of neuroticism, um, which is a, a psycholo psychological predisposition towards anxiety, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, um, well, positions of power will influence anxiety. You know, we, uh, we caution our daughters, we encourage our sons to take risks, and, and so we, in some ways, we instill anxiety in girls and not in boys. And once they, once we pass puberty and the boys are bigger and taller, and there are, you know, sexual assaults and things, uh, there's a lot of reasons why females ex ex greater neuroticism or anxiety, and that's because they're in a more vulnerable, lower status position in society. So it may not be uh, as hardwired as it seems. Let me, let me just uh, give you a way to think uh, about this just for a moment. So I think what we think, um, when we, because most of these, these sex differences that we keep reading about reaffirm the stereotypes that we already hold. And so we feel validated somehow culturally that the inequality that we see in the, is actually sort of natural. So we think that gender difference is the cause of gender inequality, right? Mm -hmm. From these differences comes the inequality that we see. Upper body strength, uh, math ability, whatever. What if you flipped it? What if you said that gender difference is actually the result of the gender inequality, 
right? If you began to think about it that way, what you would say, the answer to your question is, if you reduce gender inequality, which is a political, uh, a political question, reducing gender inequality will actually enable us to see that we are more similar than we are different. So I would flip it. I would make it a political question because I think that we have to, we have to challenge that inevitability of the gender difference leading to gender inequality. And then we just sort of, see, can't do anything about it. <laughs> and I think that political resignation, we see that in many, many spheres right now. I think that's a really important thing to challenge. Um, so uh, we have zero minutes remaining. <laughs> um, does that mean we get one last question? <laughs> one last question, right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you, may, you made a real good point about how the politics color how we look at all this. And you had good examples of the past. Uh, but why has the past ended? Why don't we think the same about you here on the panel? That you're invested with a certain political perspective and that in one generation we'll chuckle about you. So I hope so. Hopefully I'll be gone by then. So, <laughs> so, so, so tell us why your objective and past generations of researchers were subjective. Uh, well, we can see past generations were just nonsense. When you look at Charles Dana and, and um, Edward C. Clark, Edward C. Clark uh, were making it up. And uh, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. But uh, I will be happy to show you large studies with tens of thousands of subjects and show you that, that these uh, brain wiring differences are quite modest. Um, you're right, you know, we're still in the very much in the middle of a social experiment. Uh, women have always been in a subordinate, uh, essentially enslaved position until fairly recently and still are in, in certain parts of the world when you look at the guardianship system in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, you know, I would just say it's, it's, it's a little, we've never done the equality experiment, to, to take Michael's example of does the equality produce the difference or vice versa. We've never had true uh, power equality, economic equality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 24 out of 500 CEOs in the Fortune 500 are women. So, you know, it's, it's hard to, to say that we're in a, in a politically egalitarian society and therefore the experiment's done, been done. I'm, t I'm a scientist, I'm very skeptical, I'm totally willing to admit that I may be wrong, but we haven't, you know, until the actual data come in in a different environment, um, I think uh, there's a case to be made. Uh, I'm looking forward to having my grandchildren chuckle at the kinds of things I believe. Um, I hope that people will build on the stuff that we've been thinking. Uh, I make no claims toward objectivity. As a social scientist, what I'm, what I'm interested actually is in, in interrogating the claims toward, of objectivity of others. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.